My name is Jeff Fair. I have a PhD in material science and engineering from the University of Minnesota. I have a BA in physics from Brigham Young University. I've worked with uh, solid state reactions. I've worked uh, um, characterizing materials, uh, ma semiconductor materials, thin films. Uh, I currently do a lot of work with uh, nanoparticles as well as uh, solid state reactions. The way I got involved in 9-11 research was about in 2005. Uh, I had read Steve Jones' paper on, uh, his initial paper on why the buildings collapsed that day. Um, to give you a little background, on, on the day of 9-11, uh, on September 11th, um, I was actually in Albuquerque um, waiting to, I had an appointment to, on, uh, at Sandia National Lab, which is part of Kirtland Air Force Base. And that morning, uh, a colleague of mine knocked on the door and said, as I was getting ready, he said, uh, a plane just flew into one of the Trade Center towers. And I thought, that's strange and continued to get ready for our appointment. A um, little while later, he came back and said, a second plane flew into the towers. And then I thought, OK, this is not just your ordinary news day. Something's going on. So I went out to the lobby of the hotel, and, we, and people were uh, watching the news. We all watched what happened. Um, obviously, the base, uh, Sandia is part of Kirtland Air Force Base. so. Um, we knew that we weren't going to be getting on the base that day, and sure enough, the base had locked down. No civilians were going in. So we got a car and drove back to Salt Lake City. So the news of the, the or the remainder of that day is a little hazy for me uh, because I wasn't sitting in front of the TV watching the news. And I wasn't aware of Building 7 until I read a Steve Jones paper in 2005 which talks about Building 7, talks about the strange uh, details and evidences of, uh, surrounding Building 7. And that's what really um, grabbed my attention and made me want to, to look more into this. And so I uh, actually uh, looked for Steve Jones, and I sought him out, and, uh, and we talked for a little bit. I wanted to get a feel for um, his sincerity and, uh, and his motivation for doing this. And so we talked a little bit. And uh, then I, I watched one of his uh, talks that he gave in September of 2005 uh, at Brigham Young University. And we talked some more. And at that time, I was working as an electron microscopist. I was characterizing materials. Um, and I thought that I might have something to offer if, uh, if eventually he was to come across some evidence. Um, or, or evidence was sent to him. And so I offered um, what, what I could do um, to study that and to, to get some data on, on any of the evidence that he might collect. So uh, eventually, he was able to get some, uh, some metal samples that were, that were from some of the steel beams um, from one of the towers. And we studied those. Um, I cut up some of those steel samples and polished them to, to see what we would find in the steel. Um, some of the some of the pieces that we that uh, that he acquired at the time had some corrosion. Uh, they'd obviously gone through some uh, some melting, and uh, we thought that those might be significant. So we actually were looking, and I was going in that direction. That's sort of my expertise, um, solid state reactions. And, th and uh, that's not quite solid state necessarily, but, um, but that's certainly uh, in, the, uh, um, in the realm of my expertise. So that's the direction that I wanted to go, was to look at these materials, study the phases, and maybe see what temperatures that these, uh, these phases would have to uh, uh, or the temperatures that the steel would have to get to to create these phases. Um, and then around 2006, I believe it was, um, uh, Steve started receiving dust samples and started looking at these dust samples. So uh, the study of the metal samples turned up um, different phases. Uh, uh, I did obviously see the, the, the steel phase and um, uh, iron oxide phases. Um, we did find uh, uh, an iron sulfide phase as well as um, an iron silicate phase. Uh, in all, uh, uh, looking at all the phases, uh, I came to the conclusion that 
in order to create these phases, we'd have to, to reach a minimum of about 1,100 degrees C. So that was, uh, that was some preliminary work um, that we did with these uh, steel samples that, or the, the, uh, the steel evidence that Steve was able to get from uh, various people. Um, in fact, one of the samples came from Clarkson University. Um, some, some of the steel beams had been sent out to Clarkson, or Clarkson College. Uh, and they were going to build a monument with these, and um, there was a lot of debris that was sent with the beams, and some of that evidence came from that debris, uh, as well as coming directly off of the steel columns. So um, that's where these initial samples came from. Um, obviously, it required uh, polishing these uh, these steel uh, these pieces of steel. Um, and then putting them in the electron microscope to find, and using X-ray analysis to find the uh, the uh, the chemistry. Um, I used uh, diffraction to determine the phase or the structure of the phases uh, along with the chemistry, um, and and then in that way we were able to determine the phases that were in the steel or in these pieces of uh, steel that had been corroded or melted, uh, whatever the process they had gone through. Um, that's what we were trying to determine by looking at the phases. So um, again, we found that uh, the phases that were there probably would require about 1,100 degrees C. Um, and that, uh, that didn't entirely wrap up that, that part of the study, but um, that, that, was, that was pretty significant finding. So the question became, how do you get to those temperatures? Obviously, the question of how do you get to 1,100 degrees C is significant because you don't get to those temperatures with uh, scattered office fires uh, or even jet fuel fed fi office fires. You, don't, you, you get to maybe half that uh, temperature. So that, that, uh, that question of how do we get to 1100 degrees C, that, uh, that became fairly important to me and uh, one of the things that obviously get, uh, made me more motivated to, to look further into this. I don't know that I could I could really speculate as to I mean there's there's any number of sources of heat that could that could create that temperature, but certainly not uh, jet fuel burning in open air in an office. Um, I guess what makes this uh, what makes these findings significant is um, well it, it's sort of the manner in which we found them uh, the way that they, the morphology in other words of of the grains of these phases. You don't get uh, you don't you don't get these phases uh, with an oxyacetylene torch or or whatever torch you use to cut the steel. You don't get these phases um, existing together the way that we found them. Uh, so it's I, I don't know I mean yeah people might say well they cut up the steel couldn't you create phases with a torch? Um, yeah you probably could. I, I'm not going to deny that. I don't you know I mean that's um, and if that's what uh, it, if that ends that investigation, then then I think what has to happen is you, you have to be able to take a torch and show that you can create these phases. And and uh, so far nobody's done that. So I don't know. You know, I'm not going to say that you can't do that. Um, we did find small amounts of aluminum in some of the uh, in some of the specimens. Um, more significant probably was the sulfur content that we found. In fact, in one piece, um, I found a pore in the steel that, w that had pure sulfur uh, embedded in the pore, uh, which I thought was very strange. And um, so that's when I, I really started looking for sulfur in, in, and, and finding it in more abundance in some of these, fa in some of these phases. So then, of course, the, the next question is how do you get how do you get the sulfur um, in these uh, pieces of steel or, or in the debris? And, um, and that question is, is unanswered. Uh, there, are, there are possibilities for sulfur, I mean, any number of possibilities. Um, there is a, there's a version of thermite called thermate, which has uh, sulfur in the, in the thermate to, and what the, th what the sulfur does is it, it uh, it's sort of like um, salt on ice. It, it creates eutectic temperature, so it lowers the melting point of steel, and in that way it can cut through the, uh, the thermate can cut through the steel or melt the steel 
more quickly um, than regular thermite. The finding of aluminum in these steel samples, or what used to be steel samples, um, also supports the theory that thermite was used to melt the steel. I would certainly love to get uh, an official sample of the steel uh, that we know came from a large piece of the steel. Uh, this was actually done by Jonathan Barnett. Um, he was contracted with FEMA or by FEMA to do this, and he, he actually took some of the um, some of the steel members and, and cut them up. And he, he selected some very significant pieces of steel. He, he t found ones that had um, oxidation or sulfidization uh, of the steel members. Uh, some of them looked like they'd been vaporized, certainly melted. And he, would, uh, he cut up uh, portions of that steel at that, uh, at that point or at the locations where he saw the sulfidization. And, what he, and he found uh, similar things. He found iron sulfide uh, as one, in one phase. He found that the, the sulfur phases, or the, the phases rich in sulfur, were attacking the grain boundaries of the steel, which is exactly what uh, thermate would do. It would, it would go into the grain boundaries first to attack the steel and then melt the steel as it did that, uh, create that eutectic, eutectic temperature. Uh, his findings were, were significant in that um, uh, he not only, this was, uh, he originally started with steel from Building 7, and his question was uh, then, do we find the same things happening in steel from Buildings 1 and 2, Towers 1 and 2? And uh, the answer to that was yes, they found very similar things to what they found in, building, in the steel of Building 7. And then the next question was, how much sulfur do you need to create these sulfur phases? He did some, some preliminary tests, and I think those were significant. And those are some tests that, that uh, if I had, the, if I had the, uh, the means, if I had the steel and, uh, and, and the time, I would, do these, I would like to do these tests. Uh, how much sulfur do you really need to create these uh, sulfide phases or these sulfur-rich phases? Some people have speculated that the sulfur could have been supplied by the wall board or the gypsum board that was uh, present in the buildings. Um, and I believe that's calcium sulfate, or uh, so it is a sulfate-rich phase. However, in order for that to happen, in order for you to, to get sulfur out of the wall board, you've got to heat up the, the gypsum board to high enough temperatures to uh, disasso or dissociate the calcium from, from the sulfur. And then you'd have free sulfur and be able to, and then the sulfur could then attack the steel, uh, attack the iron phase or the, the steel and create these sulfide phases uh, which go into the grain boundaries. Um, but again, you've got to get extremely high temperatures to dissociate those two things. And, uh, and then you'd have the temperature, and then certainly if you've got those temperatures, you've got the temperature to melt the steel. So, so this would require high temperatures, certainly higher temperatures than you get in normal office fires. So this is impossible to achieve in a normal office fire, even a jet fuel fed office fire you wouldn't achieve the temperatures required to dissociate the calcium and the sulfur in order for the sulfur to then attack the grain boundaries of the steel and melt the steel. So this is, this is probably one of the reasons they use wallboard, is that it's, it's not going to dissociate in normal office fires and, uh, and, and attack steel members that are part of steel uh, frame structures. So this is certainly an experiment that could be done to, to see if, uh, if you get the sulfidization and this attacking of the steel member by uh, wallboard, uh, uh, by just putting the two together in high temperatures. Certainly a, an experiment that could be done, um, something that, uh, that uh, debunkers could, could easily do. Um, I don't know why it hasn't been done, although I can speculate that it, it, it doesn't work. So <laughs> we use wallboard to protect the steel. Uh, the, the, uh, it's, it, historically, this, is never, this has never been a problem that wallboard uh, dissociates and you have a lot of sulfur in fires attacking steel members. So a wallboard is actually there to protect the steel. So Jonathan Barnett's study, uh, which I thought was very well done and, and quite extensive, is all documented by FEMA in Appendix C in their, in their BPAT report that was May of 2002. Unfortunately, it was never used in the NIST report, and, uh, and it was, wasn't really used in the explanation uh, for how the buildings fell in the FEMA report either. So it seems that 
although the report was done and it was very well done, it was never really used by the report to explain or 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 should I say that the questions that they brought up in that in that report, which are how do you get that much where did the sulfur come from? How much sulfur do you need to create these phases? And how do you get the temperatures required to create the phases? I, I believe in the report, uh, they put a minimum temperature of 940 degrees C to create the phases, and that's at the eutectic. So those questions were never addressed by either the report um, or uh, either, either by Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Barnett's report or by the FEMA report itself or by the NIST report. These, these questions were never addressed. And I think they're significant because you have to, I mean, you've got this evidence here. How do you, how do you get those temperatures? How do you get, where do you get the sulfur? These are things that, that we should be asking and people should be investigating. So around in 2006, uh, Steve Jones was uh, working on some other evidence that he had acquired, which was uh, dust evidence. And one of the things that he was doing was going through that dust and with a magnet and finding uh, spheres, microspheres, whatever you want to call them, um, and, and looking at those spheres and trying to get the composition of those spheres. It's a, it's, it's a, a, a difficult task at best to try and determine the composition of these spheres because uh, in order to get the internal composition, you've got to somehow break these open. And, and fortunately, we were, uh, he was able to find some that were actually broken open. Uh, at this time, Steve was working with a student uh, at Brigham Young University, uh, a BYU student, a physics student. And uh, Daniel Farnsworth is his name. And, he, um, and together, they were working on the electron microscope and uh, using x-ray analysis to try and determine the chemistry of these microspheres. Uh, when, uh, to be honest, when Steve told me um, he was looking through the dust, through these dust samples, I, th I thought this was a, a fool's errand. I just thought, you know, this is a needle in a haystack. I didn't, I didn't really think that they'd find anything significant, uh, to be honest. I really didn't. And I was stuck, you know, I mean, I, 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 so I stuck with working on these uh, steel uh, samples, which I thought were significant, and I, I still do. Um, eventually, Steve came to me and said, we're finding uh, these red-gray chips. And I really didn't think anything of it. Um, it could have been, they, they could have been anything. And, um, but he kept, the, the, the significant thing about the red-gray chips was not just the frequency in which they were finding them, but also they were attracted by a magnet, and which, is, which was his method for uh, pulling out these spheres. And so he was pulling out the spheres as well as the red-gray chips. And so he came to me and said, we're getting some, some interesting compositional analysis from the red layer of these red-gray chips. We're actually seeing peaks of aluminum, as well as other, other things. But the, the aluminum peak was significant because uh, you, and, and so he'd find these aluminum peaks, and, as well as iron peaks, and oxygen peaks, and, and, and various other peaks. But the aluminum and the iron and the oxygen together were very significant because this is the, your composition for thermite. Um, so that's when I started to get a little bit more interested in the dust and get more interested in these red-gray chips. So, um, but I didn't really start working on these red-gray chips. And Steve and Daniel were, were continuing to find uh, things about the chips. And they would bring that information to me. And eventually I said, OK. We were, I remember we were sitting uh, in my office, and he was talking about the red-gray chips. And I thought, OK, if you really want to see if these red-gray chips are significant, um, what we could do is take one of these chips and put it in a calorimeter and see if they're energetic. And, uh, and at that point, Steve was saying, well, how do we find a calorimeter? Who's got a calorimeter? So I found a, a lab that had a calorimeter that we could use. Uh, a, it's, it's a DSC, a Differential Scanning Calorimeter, and, um, and learned quickly how to use the calorimeter and how to calibrate it and make sure that we were doing everything properly. I actually had um, somebody that really uses it a lot um, there with me as I conducted these experiments. And so we, we put one of the chips, uh, one of the larger chips that we had, um, into the calorimeter and let it run to see what would happen. And that was really a turning point for the red-gray chips for me because we got a peak on the calorimeter 
which shows that these red gray chips were energetic. They were putting out uh, more energy, and I mean they were they were very exothermic, and the 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 uh, width of the peak was also significant because the it showed the power that the chips had, um, and so that's that was really the turning point for the red gray chips, and that's when I got very interested in the red gray chips and, and joined them in their study of the red gray chips and really took off with that. So that was uh, but. The, the significance of the, of the calorimeter cannot be uh, understated here. Uh, the calorimeter can't lie to you. If that thing uh, pops off, if you, if you get a sharp peak in the calorimeter, that material is energetic. Um, and the, the degree to it, you know, the, the degree of its, of its, uh, of its energy um, is, is determined by the height of the peak and, and the power at which it, it goes off is, is the width of the peak. But we were finding very narrow peaks and very, t very high peaks in the calorimeter, which showed that this, this very, very small chip had a lot of energy packed into it, uh, more than you would find in everyday materials at the office. So, um, and certainly the, the number of chips that they were finding in these random dust samples made the, the fact that, uh, I mean, the fact that they were present there in such quantity um, also made them significant. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't an anomaly. It certainly wasn't an anomaly because we were, we were getting multiple dust samples from, from multiple indiv individuals who uh, had no connection with each other, had no connection to Steve or myself, and they're sending us these uh, dust samples and every one of the dust samples was, was showing red-gray chips. And they were, uh, it was striking in their similarity. Uh, you can you, uh, the paper that we wrote about the red gray chips. You can actually see we've taken um, images of of these uh, photographs of these red gray chips to show these things are so similar. We we couldn't ignore these red gray chips any longer, and um, and that's where the that's where the paper um, really took off. That's where the data for the paper really took off. Some have speculated that the red gray chips are are just paint. Um, I haven't seen any studies of paint by, by those that are speculating this. Um, we did our own study of paint in the DSC and found that the, the paint will eventually burn up and turn to ash, but it certainly doesn't give you an energetic spike in the DSC. So we, we actually did some experiments to compare the elemental composition of uh, primer paint from the Trade Center uh, steel. Um, that was taken off of one of the uh, beams um, in the, the, the Clarkson College beams. Um, but it was taken from one of the beams used in the, in the World Trade Center. And, um, and the, the chemical composition did not match that of the red-gray chips. So we, we know that it's not the primer paint that was on the steel. So once the, uh, once the chips were ignited in the DSC, we, we then looked at the residue uh, or the remnant of those chips in the, uh, in the microscope again. And we did find very, very small spheres um, that were similar to the microspheres that Steve was finding in the, in the dust samples. Um, uh, smaller on average, but uh, still very similar in, in uh, composition and, and in look of, of the, the microspheres that Steve was finding. So one of the things that um, I'll just, I'll just mention briefly, um, or maybe not so briefly, about the paper that was written that uh, compiled all of this data from the red-gray chips. The first thing that we wanted to do was to establish that all of the chips were similar. And, that they, and, all, and when I say all of the chips, chips collected from the different dust samples that were collected from different areas um, in, in Manhattan, from different individuals who were not associated. So w once we collected different chips from the different samples, we then took photomicrographs as well as um, looking at them, looking at them in the uh, in the uh, scanning electron microscope, um, and then compositional analysis of both the red layer and the gray layer, and all of these things showed that these red gray chips are the same. The compositional analysis of the red layer was the same. The compositional analysis of the gray layer was the same. Their appearance uh, and 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 cleavage habit or or microstructure appeared the same. Um, all of those things appeared the same. Then we ran uh, 
multiple samples through the DSC, the, the differential scanning calorimeter, and found that they behaved almost identical. The, the peak heights were very similar, the location of the peaks were exact, and uh, so once we were able to establish that these things were all the same, um, that's when we, that we were able to then, um, with more confidence, try and determine what these things really were. Uh, and so now what we, what we have is from the composition from the, uh, the composition of the red layer, we have an aluminum peak, we have a silicon peak, we have the iron and the oxygen, as well as other peaks. And, and one of the things that we did to ensure that we weren't getting surface contamination was we just took some of these chips, which are very, very small, by the way, and under a microscope, we were able to cleave these chips or break them in half and then study the, the fresh or the broken surface so that we weren't getting surface contamination. Um, these things were coming in, in uh, bags of dust. So uh, who knows what kind of contamination you'd get on the surface. So we, we were looking at these broken or these clean uh, edges in order to get the composition. And that's where we found the silicon as well as the aluminum peaks and the uh, iron and oxygen peaks in, in abundance and, in, and throughout all of the, the, um, the red layers in all of these chips. Um, the gray layer was also interesting. We found that that was uh, mostly iron and oxygen. And again, each gray layer was identical in its compositional analysis as well as its appearance. Um, and then uh, what we found in the, from the DSC um, there, was, there was actually some significant findings in the residue. After igniting these chips in the DSC, we found uh, microspheres that were uh, very shiny in appearance. Some of them were, were almost glassy, a little translucent. And we found that the composition of, the, of, the, uh, of these microspheres, of these very small spheres, uh, many of these spheres had the exact or identical, uh, identical composition or very similar composition as the spheres that Steve was finding in the dust samples. They were also very similar to spheres found in thermite, in commercial thermite. Uh, once, once you ignite commercial thermite, you, get, uh, you also get microspheres. And the composition was very, very similar. Um, and that led to the conclusion of the paper, which was, we've got some form of thermite in these red-gray chips. And I think it's a very, very strong conclusion. Um, there have been some that have, have argued that these red-gray chips could be paint of some form. We actually did a study on uh, we did a study on some epoxy paint. We put that in the DSC. We found that that paint would just would just burn up and, and turn to ash. So um, you may get a, a minor exothermic peak, but it's nothing. It's not energetic. It's a very smooth, wide peak, and uh, it's certainly not an energetic material. As part of the residue uh, of the paint that we, that we ignited in the DSC, um, the actual paint, there was, it was basically ash. There were no microspheres found in, in the paint sample that had been ignited in the DSC. Um, we also took paint that came off of the WTC steel and looked at that in the SEM and, and did a compositional analysis of that and found that it was not similar to the red-gray chip or the red layer of the red-gray chips. Um, so it wasn't, the red-gray chips are not the primer paint that was used on the WTC steel. There are a lot of questions that came up during the paper that have been left unanswered um, or that are, that are unanswered and, and need to be answered. Uh, uh, just an example, what is the gray layer? What was the, what was the purpose of the gray layer? We know it has a lot of iron, we know it has a lot of oxygen, and um, we've found that uh, we do see some, uh, uh, there's a hematite phase, um, but there are other phases present in that gray layer, and we don't know quite what that gray layer is or how it's adhered to the red layer. Certainly further study needs to be done. Um, we certainly need to be doing more work to find out what that is. Occasionally we would find an intermediate layer between the, the red layer and the gray layer, which was rich in carbon, perhaps a polymer type layer. Um, but again, we, don't, we, we need to, to go further with that study to, to figure out what those things are. There are some, some characteristics of the red layer that are rather significant. Uh, one is that it, 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 it's not homogeneous. There are, 
different uh, particles or grains within the red layer that we studied. Um, one appeared very bright under backscattered electron uh, microscopy, which indicates a, a heavier phase. And we looked into those small particles. They were, they were rhombohedral in shape and very consistent throughout the, the layer. They were about uh, 100 nanometers in size, roughly, um, and very consistent in both their size, um, the, the shape of them, and as well as the, the composition that we could get from the SEM. Additional studies in the TEM found that these were iron oxide phases. So these particles, these small uh, bright particles, they appear bright in the SEM images in the paper. Um, these were, in fact, uh, iron oxide phases that we were able to uh, pin down using uh, the transmission electron microscope. There were other phases present as well, or other particles present in the, in the red layer. Um, there were some plate-like phases, or plate-like particles, and, uh, and those, all, again, those were uh, consistent throughout the red layer, throughout all of the samples that we found. Um, and, and those appeared to have uh, a higher uh, aluminum and silicon peaks in their compositional analysis. And um, one of the significant things about what we find in the red layer is um, the fact that these, these particles that we find in the red layer um, are, are the fact that they're consistent and the fact that, I mean, consistent in shape and in composition and in size uh, leads me to believe that, that these things are not naturally occurring materials. The red layer is not a naturally occurring material. Sure, you have iron oxide everywhere, um, that you have iron, you get an iron oxide, but you don't get them in nice little 100 nanometer rhombohedral shaped uh, particles inside of uh, this red inside of a red layer, a very small red layer. And by the way, these, um, just to give you a reference on the size, these particles that are in the red layer are thousands of times smaller than, say, the width of a human hair. So these are very sophisticated particles, uh, very sophisticated materials, not materials that we would expect to find in uh, the, uh, the, the demolition debris of, of, a, of a building. In order to get that kind of consistency with shape and size and, and, and to be that small, um, these really are sophisticated materials and probably only developed in, in a laboratory. They may be processed outside of a laboratory, but they're developed in a laboratory. There were several other things that, uh, um, that were found that, uh, that we put into the paper that I think are very significant and the, the conclusion of the paper really does fit well with the data that we collected. Um, our conclusions were that, that the red-gray chips are some form of thermite or a nanothermite or, or uh, an energetic material which is very similar to thermite. Um, and the, those conclusions are very, very, it's a, it's a very strong conclusion given the data. Now others may say, well, could it be something else? Certainly. It certainly could be something else. I'm not about to say that we've, we've you know, completely uh, ruled out everything. But uh, the conclusions we made in the paper are very strong given the data. If there's another possibility, that's, uh, that's something that somebody can come forward with uh, using the same very stringent scientific method that we used in this paper and, uh, and publish that and, and uh, they'll find, I'm, I, I'm, I, can, I can guarantee they will find that our work is completely reproducible. If, if you find other red-gray chips, they will look and, and have the same composition and the same behavior in the calorimeter as the red-gray chips that we found. Now, if they come up with different conclusions than we do, that's their prerogative, of course, and I'd like to see that. I'd like to see other people looking at these things because that reproduces our results and it also uh, brings us to a, a discussion which, is, which needs to happen. We need to be talking about this. There needs to be another investigation of the events of that day. Uh, and that's why, that's why I signed the petition at a &E, uh, at the A&E website, A&E uh, for 9-11 Truth. Um, architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. That's why I signed the petition, and I, I do believe there needs to be another investigation.